Mr. Woodgriff, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your story and your wisdom with our audience of leaders and aspiring leaders. So thanks for joining us. Thank you. We um we were just talking about your early childhood and being in the kindergarten and knowing that someday, what did you want to do when you grew up? I wanted to be a teacher and an author. I had an idea that I'd be a teacher during the week and an author on the weekend. So that was my, my big plan. And, um, I think I just like loved school. I loved my teacher at that time. I was, you know, just a little kindergartner and, um, maybe deep down somehow I knew I just, I would end up in education. So, yeah. And, and, and here we are just a few years later, we won't, we won't give the exact years, but a few years later, and you're, you're now superintendent and CEO of a school system, say jokes in California. And so I would imagine that's a, a life dream fulfilled starting back in kindergarten. So what did you, what did you know about it back then? What did you love about the world of education as a little kid? Just the curiosity. I think, I think uh, I'm just generally a curious person and I, yeah, that's what education is. And I love um, sparking that, keeping that curiosity and students and just seeing, um, the love of learning. Really. I loved learning new things. I still enjoy learning and growing now and, um, being part of that with, with our students, keeping that going. And, and, and how, how do we, you know, it's such a distraction, right. In our day and age where for kids attention, all of our attentions with phones and social media and technology. And I think in a way it's, um, it's many, many good things, but uh, there's an underside of that too. That's I think making many of us almost like despondent and dependent on other people and dependent on YouTube videos to tell us what's good and what's bad and what's creative. And so what do you, what's your take on that? How do we, how are you keeping creativity and that spark of interest alive in the students that you all serve? It's a great question. I, it's really this, the school that, um, that I work for and that I founded with a group of us women about nine years ago, um, it, it's really founded in personalizing the learning for each student. And so I think that when, um, when you really nurture the, the student and what their interests are and you help them to learn what they're good at and what they enjoy doing, and you encourage those things, that whole child that, that's where you're able to really, um, help maybe pull them away from their phone and like, you know, help them figure out what they enjoy doing, what they don't enjoy doing. One of the things that we're doing that's newer is we're taking our college and career pathways for high school students and looking at how we can bring those to our elementary students so that they can explore their interests. So we have uh, a whole library of classes for them. They can take, um, from Legos, we have like a young chef's class. We have um, just all kinds of enrichment classes for our students. And, uh, you know, some of them are getting them out of the house. So they're, you know, out, out, um, out in the community. So I think just providing, I feel like our job is to like really to, to give the students and the parents so many different choices and options that they can try things and figure out what they love to do and what they don't love to do. Because I think that's equally important is to find out, um, you know, what, what you don't want and what you do want in life. And so starting at the really young age when they're little and they're getting to take like these art classes, we have coding classes that they can kind of really see that at a young age. And then that they can go all the way up through high school if they so desire with those powers. I love that. I love that sort of giving giving lots of options to spark that curiosity, spark that interest. My dad always said there's one way to find out what you want to do in lifetime. It's by doing all the things you don't want to do first. Yeah. I think that's so wise. It, yeah, it is. It is. It's it um, clarity. <laughs> it does it does create clarity because the only way one would experience it is by it's by leaning into it. I had a I had a chief academic officer that worked for me and um he talked about how some people wanted to go into education and he would slow them down and be like, well, wait a minute, you don't like children. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd be like, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of times we don't, we don't slow down and actually think about 
you know, what is it that I want? What is it that I desire? What's the future that I'm, I'm moving towards. And that um, is interesting to me. What do I, what do I aspire to? And I love that you in kindergarten knew pretty clearly that you wanted to be in the world of education. Um, and you said that nine years ago, you founded this school with a bunch of win- women, which is amazing. And I would imagine tremendously challenging and took a tremendous amount of courage. And as a father of two daughters and, and a son, but as a father of two daughters, you know, what, what would you, what's the story there? Tell us about that journey of starting a school and how you did it and how you mustered the courage to do so. Yeah. So we, the, the group of us, we had been working at a different school at the time and we, uh, we really, it was really a, a values kind of decision that we made that we wanted to start our own school and uh, create our own values and our own mission and vision. And so when we, uh, when we did choose to do that, it was a big, a big step because there's so many things you just don't know. And you can't anticipate that first year. We didn't know how to run an office. We didn't know how, what to do with a cum file. Um, we all were wearing like a million different hats. And I, I always tell my kids, it's like, it's really, sometimes it's just taking this one step at a time. And I know that can even be a little cliche, like just one thing at a time though. It's like, as soon as you take the first step and then the next step, I just learned that you can get to where, where you want to be and where you're going. It's just taking those steps and trusting and having, you know, confidence in yourself and the people that you're with that you can figure things out because you're not going to know everything. Like I, we didn't know so many things. I just remember going to a training on again, like what to do with a cum file and just being there and trying to learn. And it was so many years ago now that, um, it's, it's just interesting though, because it's like been nine years and I, so I can't say we're a new organization anymore, but I still feel like we are because there's so much to learn. And so as soon as we start, like we learn one thing, it's like, okay, well now here's the next thing that we get to do and get to learn and grow in. And so, um, I just think I've had to learn to be patient with other people and myself first. Like I really had to learn how to be patient with myself and how to kind of give myself space to make mistakes because until I was able to do that, I think it's, it's harder to extend that to, to other people. And so I think like starting with myself that I was able to, to learn how to do that. Um, and and to extend that to others. And then I think that's just like where the growth happens is, is through those, those and through the, like, sorry, my computer's doing something. Um, yeah. 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 It sort of, sort it starts with just taking that first step, leaping out into, into faith and seeing what, what the next step, the next step takes you forward. And the other part I heard in that is that you did it as a team that you guys all support each other. Everyone was jumping in and wearing multiple hats. And so I'd imagine that that sense of teamwork was really, really important in, in starting that journey. What was that like, um, you know, in this case, as a, as a bunch of females? Um, okay. I mean, I just, I think it's empowering. I think we like, we're very communicative. I don't know if that's different or not, but, um, I think we were able to, just support each other and to like work through a lot of like difficult situations. I don't know if it was necessarily because we're females or not, but I think that, um, we have, you know, just a group of really intelligent and motivated, really driven, (laughs) um, (laughs) individuals that, you know, wanted to do it and wanted to do a good job and create something really special for our families. So, yeah. Okay. So it, it was the, the the drive, the commitment to provide something special for the kids at the end of the day and yeah. for our families and, and community was really what, what ultimately made it happen and, and brought it about. I'm curious about, you said the values too. What were the, what were the values that you really set out marching towards? Yeah. It's funny because we had this activity, we had uh, our first meeting where we all got together so I think there were about 30 teachers and uh, when we first started the school, the very first meeting, and I did an activity where we could kind of um, look at creating like our, our uh, mission statement and, 
and to talk about our values. And it was kind of fun that after we did this collective activity at, at table groups and then in small group, smaller groups, and then we kind of met as a director team to look over the results and it just coincidentally spelled out SAGE, which is the name of our school. And so it's um, serving, achieving, growing, and equipping. And so um, the equipping over time turned into excellence. We actually, um, we kind of re revamped that about a year ago, but it's about serving one another, serving in our, serving our larger community. It's just that sort of core value of service. Um, and then the um, achievement, I think I said achievement because that was the first year with that. That was the other letter that changed to accountability. We kind of made some like small changes over the years. And accountability is just about, you know, being accountable to each other, having um, that high standard and knowing if we say we're doing something, that integrity that we're going to be doing it. Uh, the G for growing growth is about having a growth mindset. It's again, being able to, you know, we can make mistakes because we're not yet, we're growing. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, we read that book and we did that for a whole year. We did like the first year was the S for serving that we did. We spent a whole year on each of the letters. And so now we have the E for excellence. And we just found that that's something that we really enjoy providing is just like excellence and everything that we do. And so that's where the um, E for excellence came from. Oh, that's fantastic. So it's kind of fun that it made the acronym and it made it easy to remember too. And I'm assuming the values came first and then the, and then the name Sage. Well, no, because we had oh. the name, I mean, we had our values that we like knew that were kind of near and dear to us. But when we did this activity is where we were able to see like that the letters actually spelled out, um, Sage that we found that the, these like themes that from the teachers that came, that came about. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah. It's um, it's a beautiful when those things, when those two things can come together in a, in a beautiful way like that. And those are pretty timeless values, you know, that you can, you can hold on to just like an uh, an oak tree. You can have forever mm -hmm. and um, uh, keep alive forever. That's the that's the real trick. Is not so much what the words are, but what is the meaning behind those words? What does it mean for you all? When you say service, or when you say growth, um, or you say excellence, and how do we keep that alive? How do we continue to to build that into the culture? And especially as we bring on new people, help them to to map their own personal values onto the say joke values, so that there's there's that congruence. And that's a that's the work of leadership. And so I'd love to talk a little bit about leadership and how do you. What's sort of your philosophy for leadership? How do you think about leadership as the the CEO? Well, I think I think that leadership is about it's just about supporting and it's about helping your team to um, be able to do their best work and to be able to be their best self. And so I think, um, maybe in the past I felt like leadership, like you had to be a certain kind of way to be in a leadership role that sometimes I felt like I wasn't sure if it aligned with, um, with how kind of the way that I lead, but I feel like I've been able to like find my way of, um, of, of showing how you can, you can still be like lead from a human, a human point of view, like you can have, you can care about people and you can lead like with like love and compassion. Um, and there's a way to do that and still have a really high standard at the same time, um, for each individual and for the organization as a whole. So I think that's been like a journey for me, I guess, to figure out, um, how I can kind of, it, sometimes it feels like a paradox, I guess, um, to, to be able to do both of those things, to have the high standard and to have a high, you know, um, bar, but at the same time to have like compassion and to want to really, like, I enjoy supporting and, um, coming alongside. And so I think leading is about that. And then it's also about the, it is about the vision and about what we're doing and why we're doing it and, um, helping people to get excited about that and, um, keep that motivation going. Cause it's hard work 
and you have to be able to remind people like why we're doing what we're doing as well. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. There, there's a quote from, um, I think it was F Scott Fitzgerald. He says that, that high intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in your head at the, at, at the same time and still retain the ability to, to function, you know, still retain the ability to think. And, um, it's a, it is a, uh, a marker of, of leadership. And I think that's, um, although they're not opposed to each other, they actually, in our, in our, in our belief, you know, we believe that actually love meaning agape love being of service to others is at the heart of any good organization. You know, even the most capitalistic sort of money driven organization, if they're not providing some value, if they're not providing some benefit to, to their audience or to their customers, then they're not going to continue to exist. And that's true if you're on Wall Street or you're, you know, you're running a nonprofit or you're running a school that at the heart of any good organization is this idea of, of being of service, of providing a value of loving on your people. And that includes your, your customers or your students or your parents or your community, uh, especially because without that, then, you know, what are you doing? What are you, what are you there for? So I love that. That's, I love that love is your, is your focus point and compassion. <laughs> How do you keep that alive as a leader? How do you hold that high standard and keep the team moving forward and continue to provide that, those sets of values? Um, I think it's just a lot of internal dialogue and just reminding myself of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And that sometimes it, you know, even if I get feeling like, um, you know, wondering about like a person and why, you know, why they didn't do this or why they didn't do it that way, the way that I had in my mind, just reminding myself of all of the, the things that I do love about that person and what their strengths are and really focusing in on those strengths at the core of everything. And then it's, it's like it, it, as soon as I am able to do that, then it like sort of frees you up to give like a lot of grace. And I think that the grace is really important, but also like having these conversations and direct conversations about, um, when things do go wrong, but when a person really like does feel like you care about them and that they, that you're seeing them through their, through a lens of strength, right? Like if that's the filter that you're seeing, uh, the end of the person through, then when you're having these other conversations, I think it comes a lot easier and they're more able to sort of accept the, like to hear what you're having to say. So like if, if you're needing to share something or, um, with the person and they're, you know, like a certain area where they maybe like are not performing so well, it's like, but they know that you're seeing them through this lens of, um, positivity, then I think, um, like as a human being, right. Like, cause I know I, make mistakes all the time and I forget to do things and I don't communicate perfectly. So it's like knowing, you know, giving myself that grace, like I said before, like giving myself the grace, then I, it, I, it can extend it more freely to, to other people. And, um, I think I forgot exactly what your question was. So I don't even know if I fully answered it, but that was where my mind, um, my mind went. Yeah, no. And it, it makes a lot of sense. Cause we, we talk about this quite a bit with clients, um, that, if you're not taking care of yourself as the leader, if you're not extending that grace, if you're not patient with yourself, then how can you expect to be able to, to nurture that within your people as well? It doesn't mean that you're, you're not going to have the high standards. It does not mean that you're not going to have excellence. Right. It does not mean that we're not going to have maybe some tough conversations, but at the same time, we have to, we have to see each other as human beings mm -hmm. and relate to each other as human beings. And when we can, when we can work together that way, we can get so much more done. And um, so I love that you're you're clearly you're clearly stating that we got to start with ourselves as leaders. We got to start with ourselves and make sure that we're taking care of ourselves, so we can then take care of and, and lead our people. And yeah. um, as you as you think about sort of the future of say jokes and the future of you know what you're excited about for your your people, the people that you lead, what's at the top of that list? What are you excited about over the next couple of years here? I'm just excited to see where we're going with, um, with for our students. Like we've really created some new 
new programs in the past couple of years that are starting to gain some momentum. One of them being those classes I was talking about for students and building out these pathways. And I would just love to see um, sort of the data, I guess, behind that to see how it's a little bit, a lot of what we do is an experiment. It feels like sometimes we're scientists like experimenting and trying to find you know, what is going to work and what's not going to work and uh, what's going to really make an impact for our students. So I, I'm excited to see how these pathways that like start even in kindergarten, you know, through high school, what's the impact of that? What is the impact when these kids go out and become young adults and they're out in the, out in the world and being able to um, talk to them, to talk to them as they're in college or they're out in their career and they're in the next phase of life to hear like the wonderful stories that they might have. So I'm excited about that. We have our 10 year anniversary of coming up. And so we're going to do a big celebration of that uh, this summer. So that's a more of a short term, just fun thing that I'm looking forward to, uh, to celebrating everybody just at this school works really hard. And um, I just, I'm looking forward to celebrating all of the hard work that's gone into the past 10 years. So that's great. That's fantastic. Yeah. Because if you don't celebrate, if you don't show as leaders, if we're not showing our people all the progress we're making, then that can create a sort of a, a disengagement, you know, can have people check out, which is a, you know, a huge reality of what we're facing. I just saw a Gallup survey that said that 23% of people are engaged in their jobs and they were celebrating that that was an improvement over previous data, which is pretty sad if you think about it, you know, that we've only got 23% of our people across the country engaged in what they're doing, then mm. that's not really a great sign. It means that, in fact, they they said 50, I think it was 51% of, of employees are actively looking for a new job. And a lot of our, a lot of our job as CEOs, as leaders is to help people be engaged, help people find something that animates them and gets them excited about what they're doing. And so your idea of, you know, it's, it's not a simple thing, but it's, it's, it is, um, it's not an easy thing, but it is a simple thing to have like a 10 year celebration like that. But it's so, so important to slow down and to say, Hey, look, look at all the amazing things we've accomplished over the last 10 years. And here's what we got in store for the next 10 years. Here's what we're excited about for the next 10 years. And how do we continue to, to build that up? So as you think about your own your own team and your own culture. Um, what is it that you want to go to work on over the next, let's say the next 10 years? I think that like, it's just an ongoing looking at our systems as we've grown a lot. Um, since we started the school, we started with about 1200 students and we have about 4,200 now, and we're growing quite a bit every year. And there's that expression where you're building the plane while you're flying it. And it has definitely in some ways felt like that because you create like an organizational structure that works and then you're constantly growing and, and tweaking it as you go. And so I'm trying to real, we're trying to look right now at like, how do we, how do we really look way ahead and what would that structure ideal structure look like at that time? Like if I could go back in time, I would have done that when we started the school. But again, we were kind of like, I was like checking POs and <laughs> wearing every hat you could ever imagine. So you didn't really have the capacity, but it's like now slowing down, like really looking like at some of the structure we have in place and the systems we have in place, like spreadsheets are not working for us any longer. So it's, um, it's nothing super it like maybe exciting, but it is because it's so necessary for people to feel like the work they're doing is meaningful. And so when you're kind of feeling frustrated because you're inefficiently working in all these spreadsheets and those things are slowing you down from doing the work that really matters the most, even let's say for our teachers, and um, if some of those systems aren't working well, then it that can create. So that's some of the friction that I think that we're feeling right now is, um, is just a little bit of that like tension, that friction that happens when things aren't as smooth as they like necessarily could be. And so we're working on that. It's one of our big like strategic goals. And um, I mean, I think, I don't know, like culturally, I feel like we have a really, I, I'm really lucky. I like work with really engaged 
passionate people and, um, and who really, you know, work collaboratively together. So I think it's mostly going to be in our systems and in our, our structure and just keeping to hire this, the right people and, um, looking for those alignments that we've really figured out who we are even more since we started the school and, and bringing in people who align with, um, the work that we're, we're doing and our values and the mission vision, all of that. Yeah. It all, it all comes back to the people, the people, the people, and mm-hmm. how do we invest in them? How do we hire the right people? How do we build up the people? How do we grow our people, you know, back yeah. to one, one of your core values of growth. And we would, we would assert um, that the function, the primary function of leadership is to help your people grow. And the the systems and structures are important, absolutely. But what I might add to your list is how do we grow our mindsets? How do we, because what got us to, to 1,200 kids that got us to 4,200 kids is not going to what is not the same set of skills that will get us to 10,000 students. We're going to have to change our our own thinking, our own just the way we work as individuals, as, as, as leaders, as executives. And um, so we can continue to create that sense of buy-in and passion and, and engagement. It's um, uh, makes me think of just, as you know, a couple weeks ago, we released our, our book, finally, the great engagement Uh and um, uh, number one bestseller already, which is pretty awesome. And uh, we've been blown away by all the support out there, but it reminds me of the simple concept that we put in the first chapter, which is, you know, that engagement is, is aspiration times empowerment. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot of what you just talked about is you've got a great keep great group of very passionate people who are aspiring to a better day for the kids and for the future. And that you've all empowered each other. You know, this isn't about ego. It's not about title. It's about, we all, we all need to get done. What we need to get done. We all need to, to accomplish what we need to accomplish. So we've, we've empowered ourselves to make that happen. And when you can combine those two things, it's a, it's a really powerful way to create that engagement that, that employees I think are especially desperate for nowadays because people feel, you know, feel checked out. Mm-hmm. So um, time is flying by as it usually does here. So uh, what um, what advice would you have for young aspiring, you know, school superintendents, school CEOs um, that are out there listening to this right now? What what would you what advice would you want to give them? Hmm. I think it kind of goes back to a lot of what I already shared, but it's, it's really about, um, I think you just have to, if it's something that you want for yourself, you have to, um, be, you have to know it's a lot of hard work and you have to believe that you're, that you can handle. It's a lot of internal coaching. So it's like, you know, trust that you can figure things out. There's going to be problems. There's going to be challenges and like expecting that and knowing that going into it. Um, and just, just treating yourself well throughout that process and, um, finding yourself a good, a good coach, (laughs) um, it helps, it helps to have people like just to surround yourself as much as you can with people who are going to, uh, support you in that journey, whether it's at, you know, professionally, like the people that if you have the ability, you know, to hire and choose a team that's diverse and different, I love to hire people that have different experiences, different qualities than I bring to the table so that we can really um, have a well-rounded out team. And, and then just like in your own, you know, your personal life, it matters too, because you need to have people around you that are, um, they're going to encourage you and and that are going to help to be there to support you as well. So just be patient and, um, kind to yourself and, and, uh, work hard. And, yeah. Um, I think it all works right, out <laughs> right back to where you started, right? Yeah. Work hard. Be patient, be good to yourself and work hard. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of hard work. Yeah. We miss that part out. often. We're, we want the quick fix. You know, we want the, we want the CEO title and the pay, right. But we don't necessarily realize all the hard work that goes into it. And so I'm glad that you, you reminded all of us of that very fact and um, keeping that alive because it's, it's uh, anything that's worth doing is, is hard work for sure it's a sacrifice. Someone once said, and I thought you have to know that going in, you are, 
you cannot do everything. And so, you know, that you're sacrificing some things, um, to be able to do it. So I, just, I, it's just a lot, a lot of reminding yourself of what you're doing and why you're doing it. And, um, and then it doesn't feel like a sacrifice so much. It feels like you're doing something that really matters. Cause you are, cause you are, that's why it feels that way. Right. Cause you're absolutely making a difference and we've got one precious life to live. So why not do it in the service of something that actually matters. And I love that you added to that, you know, make sure you get some support, whether it's from a professional coach or an executive coach, or just a friend, make sure you surround yourself with people that can support you through that journey and call you to your higher self, not just support you like, Oh, you're doing a great job, but actually encourage you, challenge you sometimes push you sometimes because we all need that. We all need that external love and support to make sure we're we're not defaulting to our comfort zones and what makes us comfortable but we're pushing ourselves to the the next best version the next best option the next best way of being in the world as as leaders because when we can do that then the people will follow our lead and especially in education i think that's so critical because we want the students to grow and learn so we need to go first as adults we need to continue to grow and learn mm -hmm. So what's um what's a book you recommend for the audience here, Krista? What's a besides our amazing book? Of course, I know besides you your amazing book. I know. Um so the book we're reading this year uh, at Say Joke Together is called Radical Candor by um by Kim Scott. And um I think why I'd recommend it is because I, I it so much of what you do in leadership is about, is about communication and is about being able to have candor and being able to help people grow and to, um, and to do that in a way where, where, um, it's received well, and it's received in a way that they, um, that are, they're going to want to grow. And so she has a whole, like a little matrix. It's like, there's four different quadrants and, um, she, it talks about how you have to care personally and challenge directly. And again, it, sometimes it feels like these things can go like be working against each other, but when, um, when you really do it well, that that's where the radical candor comes into play. Otherwise you might have like obnoxious aggression where you're challenging directly, but you're not caring personally or uh, manipulative and sincerity. I think that is a really interesting quadrant because it's, um, it's where you're not being, totally honest, you know, you might be putting in an LOL or like a hint of sarcasm into something. And, um, so that manipulative and sincerity is the thing when I think that people might more likely fall into the other one is ruinous empathy. And that's where you are, you're really caring about the person, but you're, or you think you are, but you're not, you have so much empathy toward them that it's actually ruinous. You're not helping them to grow because, because you're, um, you're not giving them that um, you're not helping to challenge them in that way. So, um, I think it's just, it's just a good book. There's so many different ways you can uh, use it with a team and opens up all the like good conversations and helps to keep communication flowing. And it's really important. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's the trick right there is to, to, how do you take the intellectual ideas in the book like that and then actually put them into practice and that's usually where there's a challenge right is the the knowing versus being gap of actually doing it um because thinking about it talking about the theory of it and then actually practicing that can be really 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 challenging which i think gets back to that you know who's there to support you who's helping you to to bring that stuff to life because the reality is most of us humans struggle with that sort of thing and we really need each other to to support each other, to make it happen. So I love that you're doing that with your team. Cause that way you can all support each other. Yeah. One thing she talks about in the book is, um, that how, like when you're in your twenties and you're at kind of the peak of your ego or something, you're entering into the workforce for the first time and how you feel like you almost have to leave your true self aside and you can't bring your whole self to work with you because you're, so focused on being professional. And of course we have to be professional, but, um, there's an element that you lose of yourself and how, and how to be true and genuine and authentic who you are and to be able to bring your whole self to work. And so I, I really liked 
that message too. Um, so I think that's really important. So. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you. And um, next time we talk, you'll have your own book that you can recommend. Cause I know that kindergarten Krista Woodgrift wanted to write a book someday. So we'll look forward <laughs> to hearing, hearing about that book. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Krista. Appreciate the time.